Hi, this is It's Going to Be Okay with Dr. Roseanne. And if you're new to me, you can go to drroseanne.com forward slash podcast to learn more about what we do and how we help kids and families who have behavioral and mental health issues. And if you're loving my podcast, share it with five friends. I'm really on a mission to change the way we view and treat children's mental health and stop people from Google MDing it, being desperate, having to be the CEO, which you are, but I want to give you the right tools. And that's what this podcast is all about so that I can prevent another parent like you and me from going down the rabbit hole. Today, we're going to talk about honestly, one of the most amazing things I've ever done in my whole career, QEG brain maps. And if you've heard about them, maybe you know what they do. Maybe you can't. We're even going to, you know, if you're watching us on YouTube, you actually can actually see one, but we're going to talk about what it is, how it can help you right now with your child really get on the right healing path. Yeah, I said healing. The brain can heal. <laughs> Nobody likes when I say that. Um, my peers get their panties in a bunch. Um, but the brain is capable of healing. I mean, it's amazing what the brain can do when we feed it the right things, right? When we, you know, use the right tools, when parents got their aging parenting on, when you're co-regulating, um, no matter what's going on, the brain can always get better. We have to look to science to show us that path. And you know that all of my work is following the science. Yeah, I love other things. I love woo-woo things. But what I'm going to talk to you about is only science-based interventions because there's a lot of great science that shows us how to help kids with mental health, behavioral, neurodevelopmental issues. We can still celebrate and love our brains and support the brain to make it better so that our kids don't struggle so much at home and school and with friendships and all that stuff so that we can be less stressed. If you are um, interested in more support, you can go to drroseanne.com forward slash group and you can join our free Facebook group because that's where we talk all about a lot of stuff. So let's talk about a QEG brain map. If this is the first time you're hearing it, I've done a big deep dive into all things neurofeedback, QEEG, and you can go back to those episodes to learn more. But really at a very basic level, it is a way to look at how the brain is functioning. And I talk a lot about dysregulation, right? Talk about dysregulated kids, dysregulated brains. And when it comes to a brain map and when we're looking we're looking at the, the health of the brain, how it's functioning in terms of brain waves, okay? And so I am looking, I'm able to see in a QEG, yes, we do them. And yes, that's the only way to get access to me. You can't get access any other way unless you're in our Brain Behavior Reset Program. And basically what it does is it tells us which areas in the brain are overworking, and which areas are underworking. And that is where you see those internalizer and externalizer behaviors. You see that dysregulation. A QEG also shows us brain communication, which is amazing. And I always say we don't talk about brain communication enough. And that's where many of our kids with, you know, autism, ADHD, learning disabilities, pans pandas, you know, anxiety, depression, all those main things that, that I love to work with and support, their issue tends to be more related to dysfunction in brain communication, either being in a rev hyper state right? You know who those kids are. Those are those irritated kids. Those are those angry kids. Those are those wall punchers. Those are the kids that tell you to, you know, off on ghoul. And then we have our understimulated kids. Those could be our inattentive ADHD. They're definitely my dyslexics. You can see right in the area that processes language. They're, it's going to be off. So when we know what is going on and that process of a QEG will help you to understand how we can do that. So you put a cap on and it measures surface electrical activity and you're able to see, we do a 19 site look. So we're looking all over the brain. They have ones with research that like are looking at 200 points. We don't do that. So when you, you do that, it's able to see every region of the brain, our frontal lobes, our limbic system, our occipital region. And we know exactly what the brain does. Okay. So if an area is underworking, 
I can't do X, Y, and Z. If it's overworking, well, then it's doing it too much. And then you're going to understand the behaviors, which very different about me is that I am a child behavior specialist. So there's lots of people doing brain maps for different regions, but they don't have experience in understanding children's behavior. So when I do a brain map, and anybody who knows who's had one with me will tell you it's like reading tea leaves. And if you listen to some of our episodes with Ellen and Gail, you're able to just cut right through the noise because I understand the connection between what's normal developmental behavior and the brain. So literally it takes me seconds when I look at a brain map and I can just tell you exactly what's going on without reviewing history. That is not typical. That is not normal. And most people can't get that level of support and understanding, but they're still amazing. And there's lots of great practitioners and I love them. So it is very useful in helping you understand. So the process is you're putting a cap on, you're measuring the brain and uh, there's artifact, meaning that somebody's moving their hands or their eyes or clenching their teeth. We clean it up. You're then compared against a database of people in your age range. We use the clinical database. So that has people with and without issues. And then I interpret it. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So I can look at that brain map and say, okay, you know, truth story, uh, you know, Joey has massive hyperconnectivity in his brain, meaning that it's just in a overdrive in every single region. And he doesn't process social information. And those areas that are related to impulse control and rage are either over or under working, and he's a kid on the autism spectrum. And this is now validated by a clinical intake, right? Because you can't just do it without the clinical behaviors behind it. This is why a QEG is such an important diagnostic tool, right? In the case of Joey, which was years ago, like he went from diagnosis to diagnosis to diagnosis, and really it was autism. And I even did neuropsych testing with Joey. And, you know, it was just so clear in that brain map what it was, and it really cut through the noise of what he could and couldn't do because he was so bright, he could memorize certain information and appear to be more capable than he is. I know that's probably an aha moment, but it really became the diagnostic that then got him the right help, the right educational setting, all the tools that we needed therapy wise. We were changing it from, you know, this is a kid that, you know, maybe has uh, ADD to, no, this is a kid with autism and and we're not teaching him appropriately to uh, understand social nuances. Uh, we're not teaching him the right way to self-regulate because we were assuming he understood the gray area because many kids with ADHD do. And so it then charted him on a different course. And, you know, luckily, you know, Joey has graduated college. It's not his real name. Um, Joey has graduated college and has done amazing. I mean, we really gave him a lot of support in many areas. It wasn't just neurofeedback. It was a lot of, you know, things to really get him on track in the right way. And so let's talk about, let's show you a brain map. So for those of you that are, are listening and, and, you know, for those of you who are on YouTube, you know, really what it is, and this is, um, I use a, a tool that really gives us a great visual representation. And so people are able to get a report and see. So this is a classic inattentive ADHD brain. So just visualize a brain with low activity, right? So low activity doesn't mean you're not smart please know that. It means that you're not powering up in the right way. And you can visualize that or if you're a parent of a kid where it's like, huh, is the first thing they say is probably an inattentive child. So this was somebody that literally just completely lacked any focused brainwaves at all. And, you know, it doesn't matter if this is, um, the result of, you know, having infectious disease where it wipes out your brain functioning. It doesn't matter if it's, um, genetic. It doesn't matter if this is a gut dysbiosis and a gut brain issue. It doesn't matter what the source is. You know, when we work with people, we get to the root causes and it's never one thing. It's always a lot of things, right? We always want it to be one thing, but it's not. So in this case, we did neurofeedback, we did diet, we did um, learning, we did a bunch of things to really help them, but they had a dramatic change. They had almost a 100% 
increase in their focus brain waves. And what did, what did that look like in the real world? This was a kid that went from, you know, his mother having to call his name, you know, 13, 14 times before he responded, you know, being nudged for every single thing that he did to being alert, asking questions, you know, uh, you know, raising their hand and being consistently successful in school, not the roller coaster, because this was also a kid that was pretty darn smart. So they would come in ready in the fall and then fall apart the second semester. And then there'd be interventions in the third and then he would do better and then fall apart. And that just went on and on and on. And so when we are looking at a brain map and we can really understand what is happening in those regions, it just becomes very clear for people that it is really an amazing tool to really get to the bottom of what's going on. It's an easy process. Uh, I think the hardest part is we don't do, um, we use gel. Um, for connectivity because it's a much shorter process than these dry crap caps and a lot of my kids can't sit. But I would say one of the things that can be sort of icky for kids is that the gel can be cold. Um, you know, we have a whole process where we warm up kids, but it's benign, it's easy, it's painless. And if you really have an awesome clinician who is a clinical mental health provider who really understands child behavior, they take the diagnostic information and they're able to make a care plan that really connects the dot between the brain and behavior. And of course, you know, as parents, you really have to understand that, you know, there are things that can really be helpful, right? And, you know, brain waves are incredibly helpful when we train brain waves and neurofeedback and there are different types. So there are lower frequencies like delta, theta, and alpha, and then beta and different levels of beta are our focused brain waves. Understanding that when we work at brain waves, they are incredibly important for attention, learning, and self-regulation. So we take you, if you're sluggish, you then tr up train, like in the case of this person with inattentive ADHD, they then could, their brain could sustain focus and brain waves impact neurotransmitters. So, you know, not, you don't always need <laughs> medication um, to have that, um, to have a focused brain. You don't always need medication. And in fact, you know my feelings. It should be the last resort. And neurofeedback is an amazing way. And there are other ways, right? But we know that when you have an ADD brain, right, what does it look like? In that case of this brain, what we saw was very clearly that this was somebody that lacked focused brain waves. And so in your deltas and thetas, you're going to have too much unfocused brain waves frontally and not enough beta. That is what an ADD brain looks like. And it looks very, very different, just so you know, from an autistic brain. An autistic brain has, as I talked about in the case of Joey, lots of hypercommunication, lots of agitation, particularly often in the limbic system, but not always. Sometimes it can be low. So there's a lot of issues with sensory processing in an autistic brain. And always the region related to social processing is weak. Um, that becomes very distinguishable and clear and must always be substantiated by clinical behaviors. And really, an autism diagnosis should require, to me, an ADOS-2, which is the gold standard of testing beyond a behavioral rating. It's a one-to-one -one test that is a play-based test that really kind of is shocking when I would give it to reflect how much the difficulties were. And then in the difference between an ADD, and I talked a little bit, touched about it, ADD, autistic, and learning disabled, learning disabled brain looks very different. And many of my kids labeled as ADHD really have a learning disability. And those learning pathways, particularly brain communication, looks very weak, as well as difficulty processing in the language areas. Because a lot of our learning disabled kids are dyslexic. Listen to the episode with Nancy McDermott. If you've got a kid and they've been red flagged in kindergarten or first grade for a reading problem, I'm going to tell you 80% they probably have dyslexia. It's very, very common. Um, and so the brains look different. And that is the key takeaway. So 
Top line, QEG, amazing diagnostic tool. When in the hands of the right provider, because this is like what I always say, it's 50% science. We know exactly what the brain does, 50% experience. So just like neurofeedback, the QEG is the same. It's only as good as the person who's coming to the table. And I would really find a provider in that area you suspect um, if you're not coming to our Brain Behavior Reset Program, which you can go to drrosanne.com forward slash help um, and apply to work with us. We have a solution matcher that will guide you to the right choice. But wherever you are in the journey, I really hope you consider a QEG. If, if your kid is a has shopping cart diagnoses, if they're diagnosed with ODD, you know, ODD is just a behavior. There's always something behind it. If they have you know, multiple layers of clinical issues. If your child is quote unquote treatment resistant, this is really an amazing tool to help you map out what you need to do. And it's the tool is only as good as the person's clinical experience who's going to guide you into that right direction. I can't say that enough because you have to understand that brain and how to actually heal the brain, right? So if you're there and you need support, feel free to reach out to us. And wherever you are in the journey, I hope this has been an enlightening conversation. I wish more people did this. Everyone who gets it done with me says, I don't know why we never found you earlier and we hadn't done this earlier because it's so powerful diagnostically. So I could talk about QEGs all day and I hope this was helpful and you're going to find a solution for you that works. Mm -hmm.